So recently I added a new stock to my portfolio and if you're a regular viewer of the channel you can probably already guess which one it is. I've talked about this stock in quite a few of my videos over the last couple of months and it's really the only one that I've been seriously considering adding to my portfolio and I finally pulled the trigger. The new stock I added is William Sonoma and I've got to say although I'm happy to finally have the stock in my portfolio I'll admit my timing could have been better. For most of the last month William Sonoma was hovering in the low to mid 110 share price range you know 111, 112 up to 115. But guys, I didn't buy into this position until after it jumped nearly 11%, and I ended up buying right around here, about $128 per share. And in hindsight, guys, obviously, I wish I would have just started my position when it was down here, way cheaper, before it ran up nearly 11% in share price, which begs the question, why didn't I buy it when it was at these lower prices? I was watching it at the time, so why didn't I pull the trigger? Well, truth be told, at the time, I was afraid I was gonna be catching a falling knife. I was afraid that I would start buying buying into the position and then the share price would just keep going down. My thought was that there's a lot of shakiness in the economy right now and if things continue to go further south, people likely won't be spending as much money on furniture and kitchen accessories and the like that William Sonoma sells, which would continue to push the company's share price down, creating an even better buying opportunity. I was trying to be patient and see if that's how it would happen. I didn't want to jump the gun and rush into my position. I really wanted to be smarter with my entry. If I'm being honest though, it got to a point where I was feeling pretty conflicted about the whole thing and I think I got in my own head a little bit. On one hand, I was waiting to see if a better opportunity to buy this company presented itself, but then again, on the other hand, the opportunity that was present at the time was pretty ideal and in hindsight, I now know that to be true. And in dealing with this analysis paralysis, at the end of May, I consulted the Discord group to see if I could get some of their insight on the matter. I said, so I'm pretty certain that I want to add William Sonoma to my portfolio, but I'm trying to be smart about my entry and I don't want to jump the gun. Even though I think the valuation is looking good right now, my instinct is telling me that the share price will continue to trickle down for the time being and I don't want to run into another KRC or Intel situation where I start buying and it just continues to go down in price. I think one of my mistakes was rushing into those positions and I want to do better this time around. In saying this, the responses that I got led me to believe that I probably was just overthinking things and I should probably just start nibbling into the position instead of continuing to sit in this paralysis. One of the responses here from Mr. Income, who is one of the Sage members of the Discord group, said it's very likely to move with discretionary retail. If you start soon, I would definitely dollar cost average. It's been dropping a long time, so eventually it will start forming a bottom and at some point you run out of sellers for good companies. My man Brandon said, I started dollar cost averaging William Sonoma around $118 per share. Could definitely go down more with retail, but I think that William Sonoma is high quality in relation to their peers. And then lastly, Morsky here didn't pull any punches. He said, in my opinion, you are overthinking. I've held it for about a year at an average price of 125 now. They have no debt, return price practically all of their profits to shareholders and are entering new markets like India and Saudi Arabia alongside the B2B part, which should continue growing. The insight from these guys was super helpful for me and thank you guys for your two cents if you are watching, but I still didn't immediately start the position from there. I still sat and waited almost two more weeks before I finally bought in, which as we saw in that time frame, saw the stock climb over 10% in share price. I officially started my William Sonoma position on June 13th, where I picked up two shares at an average cost of $128 dollars and 23 cents. And although I ended up starting the position at a higher price than I would have liked to, I didn't get in at the lowest possible price. I can't beat myself up too much over it. Everything I've seen suggests that I still bought in with a pretty decent margin of safety and it still looks like the stock is significantly undervalued. Morningstar gives William Sonoma a fair value of $209 per share, which would make it about 38.6% undervalued. Alpha spread gives William Sonoma a base case intrinsic value of 168.22, which would make it nearly 24% undervalued. And my own intrinsic value calculation gives it a $190 price tag, which would make it about 32.5% undervalued. So over a long period of time, which is the duration that I need to be thinking about these things, I don't think I'll be completely wrecked by entering into William Sonoma when I did, and I only have two shares so far. Even if the share price starts going back down, which is something I was hoping to avoid by being patient with my entry, which ultimately I wasn't, it's a good opportunity to lower my average cost as I continue to build out this position, and there's a lot to love about William Sonoma, so at the end of the day, I'm happy to buy it at lower prices. And with that in mind, taking a look at the financials, there's certainly a lot to love here. Starting here with the revenue, we can see that they are consistently growing their sales with an average revenue growth rate over the last 10 years of about 12%. And looking at their earnings per share, this is kind of slow growth for the most part over the last decade, but it's really climbed in the last couple of years there, giving it a 24.4% average growth rate over the last 10 years. And we see a similar trend here with the free cash flow, which has grown by an average rate of about 32.5% over the last 10 years. And also as a very nice 
cherry on top. If we look at the balance sheet on Seeking Alpha, we can see that William Sonoma has no long-term debt, which is a huge plus. And in regards to rewarding shareholders, we're seeing very steady share buybacks and dividend growth from this company. In fact, the dividend growth is one of my favorite things about it. Take a look at how this company has been able to grow the dividend over the years. In the last three years, this growth rate is pretty astounding. On average, they've grown it by about 19%. The five-year growth rate's also looking awesome, about 15%. And then zooming out across the last 10 years, even across a longer period of time, they are still managing double-digit dividend growth on average with a near 13% CAGR. And look at what these growth rates do to your yield on cost. With a starting yield of about 2.9%, if you just held the company for five years with these growth rates, your yield on cost after that period of time would be over 5%. That's ridiculous. Those aggressive dividend increases are great for compounding returns. I mean, you saw what it did for your yield on cost over five years. And in higher inflationary environments like what we've been going through, these are essential for preserving or even increasing your purchasing power. And looking at the dividend safety, they have a payout ratio of only 20.6%. So they shouldn't have too much of an issue continuing to grow this dividend, hopefully at that same aggressive rate. And the cash flow payout ratio is equally as nice, just under 20%, which once again, further indicates that the dividend is pretty safe. And their track record of growing and paying the dividend is pretty solid too. 16 straight years in both departments. And look at this slope down here, guys, on the dividend history chart. That's what we like to see straight up into the right. That's a very aggressive dividend growth. But with that said, no company is without its risks and William Sonoma is certainly no exception to that. For example, changes in consumer spending could affect the demand for their products. If people are tightening their belts financially, they'll be less likely to want to buy a new futon or bunk bed from Pottery Barn. Also, the company's operations and their brand image and reputation could be at risk if they're not able to effectively and timely deliver on their orders. One of the things I do unfortunately hear a lot about William Sonoma is how poor their customer service and delivery is. I mean, there are bound to be some hiccups with any big company, but if we just scroll down the list here on consumeraffairs.com, it's like all one-star reviews. It's not good. In their recent quarterly earnings call, they did address this though and said, we manage our receipts to control inventory levels and we are making substantial progress on our customer service, which was affected by the pandemic. We've successfully improved customer metrics, including on-time delivery, and we are working hard to rebalance inventories to reduce multiple and out-of-market shipments, both of which will improve service levels further and reduce costs. We are here to serve our customers. Without them, nothing else matters. Next, 66% of William Sonoma sales come from e-commerce, which can be seen as one of the company's strengths, but a potential risk that could come from this is their inability to manage the costs and performance of their digital advertising efforts. They could be throwing money down the drain if their digital marketing campaigns don't convert. Additionally, although William Sonoma has a pretty impressive portfolio of different brands like Pottery Barn and West Elm, their inability to successfully introduce and grow these brands and any new ones they bring to market in the future definitely poses a risk. I'm sure that we could come up with some other risks, but these are some of the main ones as far as I see it. And I think the company is pretty well positioned to manage these risks and weather any downturns in the economy when they do come. Now, as far as the company's strengths go, we've already talked about their strong financials, their debt-free balance sheet, and their heavy e-commerce presence. But it's also worth noting that William Sonoma is continuing to gain market share on what's regularly regarded as a pretty fragmented industry. In 2022, William Sonoma outperformed the rest of the home furnishing industry by no small margin, which indicates that consumers looking for these types of products are swarming to William Sonoma. We also briefly mentioned their portfolio of different brands, which is good for the sake of diversification, but more importantly, because of this diversification, they're able to appeal to a variety of customers across all budgets and aesthetic tastes. And a couple more growth initiatives include their growing B2B business, which continues to see solid growth, as well as their expansion into more markets around the world, which they talked about in their most recent earnings call. They said, our brand momentum continues to exceed expectations in the India market, and we are driving growth to retail expansion with the opening of our third West Elm store, our second Pottery Barn store, and our first Pottery Barn's Kids store in Q3 2023. India is a strategic market as we expand globally, and we plan to open additional locations in 2024. Additionally, we are seeing strength across all of our brands in the Middle East, led by strong design services. We'll be expanding in the region with the opening of an additional Pottery Barn and West Elm store in Saudi Arabia in Q2. Canada is also a highlight with digital representing our biggest growth opportunity for the market. Overall, I'm excited to see what the future holds for William Sonoma, and I'm excited to finally be a shareholder and have it in my portfolio. And if you want to see the rest of the stocks in my portfolio, then check out this next video right over here. In this one, I'm doing a deep dive on my own portfolio and giving it a completely objective, brutally honest review to see how I can do better and build a more streamlined portfolio. So click right over here to check it out and I'll see you in the next one.